we had uh, listened to the previous session, which was on the process of delivery, of uh, development of reforms and going through reforms. And what we want to highlight is that curriculum goes beyond issues of content, structure, and design. What we want to highlight here is that uh, inst training institutions should have strategic planning and for, for prioritization of knowledge, skills, understanding, but also personal values. Now, we want to know, are our institutions really imparting to our students all those skills, knowledge, and personal values? So I would like to start by asking uh, my, my uh, immediate neighbor, uh, the principal uh, of Nyabiaya Forestry College of Uganda, Dr. Wilson Kasolo, to tell me how is, how are you delivering? What, do you have any challenges in delivering or do you have any success stories in delivering curricula after the reforms have been done? Thank you very much, chairperson of the session. Yes, we do have challenges related to curricula delivery. And uh, I'll just run through some of them. One of them is about the quality of students. Depending on who you get on board, we've had that challenge. When we get students with the qualification that probably a little below standard, we normally would have a problem having them to conceptualize and really getting to grip issues very easily. Attitude. We are a forest training institution, and sometimes people come there because it's an alternative, it's an option, not what they wanted. So sometimes you really see people like they are not willing, but you're telling them to, to do it in terms of the profession is like <coughs> never stretching them. So we do have a challenge there, how we to turn these people around who are not thinking of forest as a profession to really act like a foresters, love it and act it. The other thing we have is to do with the the assessment, delivery. And we are looking at issues related to student assessment. These tend to be a challenge, especially as numbers grow. You finally find that to get to assess to a level that you would want, each of the students is a challenge. And also we do have um, sometimes the challenge of getting outsiders, external examiners, to come and look at what you're doing. We've been insisting on that, but sometimes you find that the relation, the people you're getting, probably their perception of your training, especially for us who are practical, is sometimes different. We also have a problem of getting to understand, getting a feedback in terms of our delivery through tracer studies. They're not regular. So we sometimes think we are doing it well. But unless we get feedback from outside there, we end up not knowing exactly where we are doing it well and where there are gaps. I think the other thing is teacher evaluation. We do have a challenge there because to really get to understand, to evaluate every teacher from a teaching perspective, we sometimes have a problem there and we would therefore sometimes not capture what are the, the failures and problems of some of the teachers. Mm -hmm. Resources are a big issue. I'll keep emphasizing this one. And we're looking at human resource in terms of expertise, especially in terms of emerging issues, the retooling of the teachers. So you find that some of the issues which are recent, probably we do not have the skills. And of course, I will dwell on the issue of teaching materials in terms of quality, quantity, and the contextual setting to be relevant to local settings, but also to apply um, aspects that are deemed as necessary from the skills development. So we do have a challenge there, the equipment, the demonstration facilities, because all these are very vital, especially at our level of training, because people must act, must really do it, to eventually get out and be able to replicate and do what you have told them in the field. Of course, the other thing which we have perpetually been having a problem with are research facilities. At our level, there is a tendency to think that research is not our area. And I think this finally makes uh, the graduates that we push out to have very limited skills from a perspective of research. Stakeholders, I think, 30 seconds, I'm finishing. I think the other issue that we have is the issue of stakeholders' participation. We have not managed to get 
stakeholders to come in and help us in terms of internships, in terms of attachments, so that finally we do have a contribution from them in our training and probably get a feedback from them. <coughs> Partnerships and collaboration are an issue. We really need to have a challenge in terms of, for example, getting to know how other people are doing it, especially being one college in the country. If we are to partner, we have to partner with other institutions outside the country. So clearly those are the issues that we have as challenges related to efficient delivery of our training program. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can pass to Prof. Paul. Yes, thank you very much. I, I guess we, the problems are the same across Africa, um, but um, I will highlight what I consider major constraints to delivery of curricular curricula in Nigeria with specific reference to my university. Um, the issue of having adequate, appropriate facilities. A number of occasions, um, you have the theory, you don't have modern um, equipment, you don't have the right facilities to, to actually deliver what you are supposed to deliver to students. We have issues with people that are not properly trained. In most universities, we have, I beg your pardon not to insult anybody, we have very old colleagues who possibly are not willing to be retrained, uh, who are not willing to learn and all that. So we have people that are not properly trained with modern um, facilities even when they are there and uh, is difficult because of some African cultures which we know. And also, we also uh, realize the fact that even among the young uh, academics, we uh, there are no uh, clear programs to get people retooled to be able to have clear knowledge of modern technologies. I, my professor from the past talked about biotechnology, and we have quite a number of people who, made, who have made claims that they have uh, knowledge of biotech, but indeed they are not properly trained, they don't have the knowledge, but they claim to have the knowledge, so we have problem of people claiming to be what they are not, and so they cannot really give what they should give. Um, we, of course, it's clear we have problem of adequacy of funding. We could review curriculum. We could have fantastic curricula for different aspects of agriculture. That has to be backed up with appropriate and adequate funding. And where they are not there, you can do little or nothing. And Issue of having um, not been able to train people appropriately to meet the industry. I, while I sat behind there, I said, I hope we will not allow ourselves as colleagues in the university to be psyched by the industries. That we are not doing as perfectly as they want, but I expect also that industry should also have a program where they retrain people that have come out of the university. So the blame should not completely be on the universities. And I also think that the industry should be able to have some linkages with um, institutions to be able to fund some specific training they want to be able to meet the demand in the industry. Um, I also um, think that for us as a people, at a major problem we do have, again, is issue of, of honesty in, in what we do. I, I beg your pardon, um, issue of honesty is very fundamental. We talk about funding, we talk about equipment, and all that. A number of people who have access to some of this, but are they appropriately utilized to benefit the change, the curricular change that we expect in universities or uh, higher institutions of training. And we issue of students, um, in my faculty of agriculture, quite a number of the students that are brought in didn't really apply for agriculture. And so we have a problem of interest, but we have also realized that where they are few students that are actually very interested, they actually graduate doing quite well. They, are, they, they have interest and all that. So issue of interest among the students. And in, in a forum, we had discussed my university that there should be a way where government will give some sort of encouragement to students in agriculture, some, so, some sort of support in a scholarship or all that. There are quite a number of students out there who might be interested in doing agriculture. I overheard somebody saying that from Kenyatta University that they don't have the funding and they're not in the university, they cannot train themselves. And those who have the funding to come to university, they are not interested in agriculture. So what do we have? We train people that are not interested in what we're doing and so they are not productive outside the university. Yeah. It's facile to put in place the formation in the domain of agriculture because 
euh, il fallait rompre avec l'université dispensant donc des, des connaissances académiques vers une université dispensant des formations professionnelles et intégrant l'employabilité donc du produit formé. Et au vu des objectifs qu'on s'était fixés dans le domaine agricole, qui était donc de former des agriculteurs dans genre nouveau, dans les techniques et les technologies, les domaines suivants, grande culture, maraîchage, horticulture, culture fruitière, sylviculture et l'agroforesterie, agroalimentaire et entrepreneuriat, ça n'a pas été aisé. Il, faut aussi, il fallait aussi, parmi les objectifs, former donc des, euh, des étudiants susceptibles de participer à une professionnalisation progressive du secteur et qui seront soucieux en même temps de pratiquer une agriculture respectueuse de l'environnement et de la qualité des produits. Et alors, il fallait inviter les, les, les entreprises, aussi bien publiques que privées, donc à la mise en place de ces curricula. Donc le partenaire devrait être là. Et c'est dans ce sens-là que l'ouverture de l'université s'est faite. Et nous avons invité ces, 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 ces entreprises dans la mise en place et des, des curricula. Et, et dans ce sens, nous avons pu mettre en place, évidemment, dans un domaine euh, tout à fait, qui était tout à fait nouveau pour nous, l'université, une licence professionnelle. Et les difficultés qu'on a rencontrées, c'était d'abord le problème des équipements, d'une part. D'autre part aussi, il nous fallait des terrains d'expérimentation. Auparavant, l'université était circonscrite tout simplement à Dakar. Et là, dans, des, dans ce type de formation professionnelle de, de, des agriculteurs, il fallait des champs d'expérimentation. Donc il nous fallait aller vers donc, les communautés, les collectivités, pour négocier avec eux, pour avoir donc, des, des, des champs d'expérimentation. Des, des formation, nous avons invité les entreprises, aussi bien du secteur public que du secteur privé, pour discuter avec eux, pour voir quels étaient leurs besoins dans, le domaine, dans ce, dans ce domaine-là, dans le domaine agricole. Donc ça, c'était la première chose. La deuxième chose aussi, il nous fallait des équipements. Il nous fallait des équipements pour donc les former dans, les, les former dans le domaine agricole. Et aussi, il nous fallait aussi des terrains d'expérimentation, des champs d'expérimentation qu'on n'avait pas. Donc il fallait aussi inviter les collectivités locales, échanger avec les collectivités locales pour tout simplement avoir donc des champs d'expérimentation. Et ensuite, il fallait aussi, euh, avec les, le secteur euh, professionnel, échanger avec eux et leur faire de la place dans les enseignements pour donner un caractère plus professionnel à nos, nos types de formation. Et c'est ainsi qu'on a mis en place au niveau donc, de la faculté, une licence professionnelle en agro-ressources et entrepreneuriat qui était une innovation parce que jusqu'à présent, on donnait des formations sans se soucier de l'employabilité ou de l'auto-employabilité du produit conformé. Avec une licence professionnelle en agro-ressources et entrepreneuriat, le produit formé pouvait être employé comme il pouvait être employeur. Et euh, là aussi, il y a des innovations dans, dans les curricula parce qu'il fallait des enseignements dans ce domaine-là, c'est-à-dire dans le domaine donc, de l'entrepreneuriat. Et 40% du volume horaire euh, était donc effectué par les professionnels. Les, différentes, les différents masters qu'on a mis en place, euh, aussi, il y avait, il y a, on a mis en place un master de biotechnologie végétale et microbienne, un master en agroforesterie, écologie et adaptation, un master en phytopharmacie et protection des cultures, un master en taxonomie, biodiversité, ethnobotanique et conservation des ressources naturelles. Tous ces masters se font sur deux ans et l'étudiant doit être titulaire d'une licence dans le domaine donc des sciences de la vie et de la terre pour avoir des prérequis qui lui permettent de... de, de d'être euh, euh, intégré facilement. Et nous allons là vers la mise en place d'un institut supérieur d'agriculture et d'entrepreneuriat. Et nous avons déjà fait la note conceptuelle et nous avons invité les partenaires à deux ateliers. Et ces partenaires invités sont tous prêts à nous apporter leur contribution tant sur le plan donc finance que sur le plan de la, la, la mise en place donc des, des, des curricula. Et donc, euh, nous sommes 
cela c'est pour mettre, donner plus de cohérence et plus de visibilité aux formations dans le domaine agricole que nous sommes en train de faire au niveau de l'université Géant de de Dakar et au niveau de la faculté des sciences et techniques. Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup, Doyen. Merci. Ok, now, uh, we, have, we have among us the private sector. Uh, Alex, you see, and we have a big head of the private sector because we have the chief executive uh, officer of Excel Hort. Now, Alex, you heard people are saying, uh, I think Prof. Paul said that industry uh, doesn't also support and you are always complaining. And also, Uh, we, we heard here now uh, also somebody saying that uh, we need industry to do something also and not to wait for university to do everything. What do you think? Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks so much. Uh, I'll straight away start on the first one. Uh, first of all, for the opportunity to share and give the perspectives of the private sector in regard to curriculum review. I'll straight away look at the delivery in terms of the reality of the delivery, as the same says, particularly on engagement. It is true uh, the private sector is not actively uh, engaged. We may say that they, they are negative, they're not participating, they're not uh, supporting, but I just want to say from experience about the engagement. What strategy that the universities have in place in engaging the private sector? The engagement is very informal. That's the reality. Can we come up with actions like a memorandum of understanding? You get to know which private sector are you talking about. That's another issue in terms of reality. We sit here and talk among ourselves, universities against uh, with universities. But which private sector are we talking about? We need to do a strategic mapping of the key private sector that you need to engage. It's not generic. And therefore, that will require tailor-made programs and strategies that can make the results, that can inform the curriculum um, agenda. Another perspective that we are facing in the private sector, where the universities need to come in, is the role of the private sector in curriculum review, particularly on influencing the research agenda. We are struggling on how to develop some products on how to increase, for instance, the life shelf. I'm exporting matoke and I make banana juice. I need great scientists to work on that. So how are we participating in the research agenda? Graduates, PhDs and masters, how are they coming up with the topics? Can we send them and we discuss the challenges of the private sector, the bottlenecks in industrial development, such that they can be smart areas of topics identification. One other area that I think needs addressal is the issue of placement and internships. I'm happy for Anafe because we, we have an understanding and we usually get some of the best students in the university and we attach them. But we're doing it for formality. You send a student for two, three weeks. What do you expect in two, three weeks? Engagement. And you want to follow up this person and you are saying the only answer now I, I had Professor Kaya from Akere two weeks back, and uh, they were following students who have come for internship uh, from the food science department. They are there for two weeks in the department of uh, wine making and, uh, and banana juice. Now, two weeks, what hands on experience do you expect? And you are assessing this person, I'm going to say, is going to be graded. But I'm happy that the universities are responding to listen, and we started discussing at the same table. The other aspect that uh, I want to um, uh, for us with is about the curriculum review processes, particularly the issue of time lag. When you talk about private sector, you're talking about money-making institutions. We are responding to the market demands. Opportunities come to pass, not to stay. And therefore, if I have a challenge of responding to the market, the curriculum review is going to take five years. It's going to take 10 years process. How are you responding to the challenges of today is the question. And then how can we see that maybe there is mid-term review? How can we design tailor-made programs and courses that are responding to the immediate needs as you go through the formality, the processes of curriculum review? Lastly, ladies and gentlemen, is another barrier, awareness. You talk about private sector. Are we aware of the research that you're doing? Are we aware of the technologies and commercialization? And here I call for 
the private sector from? Can we have an exhibition and you so call the private sector to show, for instance, if we have been engaging since 2001 uh, to date, we have been engaging a number of students and have come up with so many things. We can also be given a platform in the university to come and exhibit, but we, it should be two-way traffic. It is two-way traffic. And we should be able to know this. We create that awareness, very best good researcher, and say, look, and that will also open opportunities for employment. We don't know the best students. You are here, you're talking about, I don't know. I need people in marketing, I need people in, in product development. Do I know the best students from uh, uh, Stinyata University? Do I know the best students from Akere? Oh, if I don't get an opportunity where enough is inviting me, how many private sectors that are here, if you go in, in the whole uh, forum? So oh, we need to have deliberate strategies to respond to this. And it is through the private sector, I assure you, that employment is, uh, money is, because the, my, my professor here is talking about incentives, to create incentives and benefits that are going to encourage the students to apply, because I did the study together with Anafe in 11 African universities. Bear with me that now the enrollment of the students to uptake agriculture is, is slowing down year by year. And, the, and yet the future of agriculture, the future of Africa, if we had feed Africa, it is in agriculture. And therefore, the problem is in incentives. We must create incentives and benefits along the value chain that will encourage the younger generation to participate in agriculture. I thank you. So now we go to we will go to the discussions later, but I want us to hear to hear now from the student perspective. So Hilda is uh, working on research on her research on uh, on uh, MSc from Eldoret University of Kenya and her research actually is about internship and she's attached to ANAFE uh, secretariat and she's working with uh, several universities uh, looking at how students are performing. So uh, Hilda, can you give us your perspective as a student? Thank you. I think really students are the key stakeholders in this curriculum reform process because we are the end users of the curriculum. And I think that as much as we, we, we keep speaking about curriculum development here, as much as we want to reform the curricula, we should involve students in this because if I understand as a student the sustainability of this curriculum, then it will impact on my life better. I will be able to appreciate and learn whatever it is this curriculum that has been developed has been designed to achieve. So I, I think that we as universities need to involve students more. I come from the School of Environmental Studies in Moi University and we really had a curriculum review this year in March, but students never knew about it. I came to know about it because I was looking for a particular lecturer, he had not turned up for class, and so when I went to the department to inquire, I was told all the faculty has gone to a certain place to review the curriculum. And I'm wondering, okay, they have all gone, we have not been informed, so what is our role in all this? Yeah, because we really need to be informed. We need to participate. And as much as sometimes there are many students in a particular faculty and you can't get all their views, there should be a channel created through which students can air their views. For example, we have catalogs that have been developed explaining what each course is offering. I think it is important that before or at the start of the semester, students are allowed to audit it or critique it so that they can give their input. Sometimes, as the, the, the people here have said, the time lag also is a problem because, for example, there's been the whole issue about integrating ICT in studies. But you see, if it's going to take four years or three years before the curriculum comes back from the process that has been put if it's going to take three years for it to go through the bureaucracy and come back and be implemented, by the time you come with the, that component of ICT that once you want to, intro, to integrate, it has been passed by time. So it becomes very relevant. So I think uh, as much as the, the, the universities or the governments, the various governments have put in place certain measures to be followed in developing curricula, to ensure quality, there are certain aspects that really I think should be left for the universities to deal with. Because 
if we say everything has to go through a certain system, then we are going to waste a lot of time, and in the end of it, we won't be able to achieve whatever it is we want. I also think that uh, one of the challenges that I see in Kenya, for example, over the last one or two years, so many universities have been created, and I think not much was put into consideration as these universities were being developed. And so what you find is that we have very few lecturers who have to keep running from one university to another to offer courses. And so there's a whole challenge of them not being able to meet whatever it is they're supposed to, to deliver on. Because what will happen eventually is that they'll just be giving you notes and telling you, read that, read this but really there's no contact be between the lecturer and the student because he is trained. He has to run from one place to another to offer courses. So for me, as the target of this curriculum, I think it is important that you get my view. Sometimes, you know previously, the, the education system was such that the teacher knows, the student doesn't know, so it is a transfer of knowledge. But we have come to a situation where because of the current developments, the current ICT that is there, you find that we also have a portion of what we know. And so it is important that we develop this together. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I don't want to make any comments because I know you will come up with all the comments. So let me open the floor with first. We have enough time now because the chair has given us up to t t uh, 1.30. So I will open the first uh, round of questions with four people coming in. And they will quickly respond and I'll open another one. So the first four. Thank you very much for all the panelists to give us the insights about the different aspects that you are facing and challenges that you are facing. Uh, the beauty of being involved in a, uh, in a regional program like this is that you can actually share experiences and also somehow harmonizing uh, the curriculum so that if one country is, has shortcoming in instrument and other things, you can send students together to each other as well as when it's kind of a harmonized system then uh, you can also create a, a, a position on uh, exchange of students between the countries. So please uh, elaborate on harmonizing curricula of agriculture, which is agriculture education, which is modern and linked with the needs of the society. And this is where the private sector is coming in. Uh, that the private sector should also be involved in uh, developing curricula and asking what type of expertise is that they want you to, to so to say, what type of uh, students they want to have. And I, I'm strongly believing on, so to say, uh, curriculum development linked with research activities. Uh, and then this research activities is a type of uh, research for use, if we put it that, uh, like this. And then, again, private sector must be involved in uh, developing. The student's perspective that Hilda is mentioning is actually very important because we know that the agricultural education in most of the countries that we are talking about is not modern, modernized and they are not responding to the needs of, of the new generation of scholars. Yeah? Uh, another issue that is important and it has to do with the quality of education is actually along the sign the, the development of curricula you need also to look at incentives for the uh, lecturers. If the incentives is not there, then the, the, the example of Kenya, that lecturers are looking for more money. They're running from one university to another, another university and only giving some kind of copies to the student. Take this and then I will examine you after that. So please consider, because now we have uh, the names of many of the universities here consider about the incentives for the lecturers because it is at the end the quality 
uh, our education is very much depending on the lecturers as well. Thank you. Uh, Kenya, uh, and also have been in, uh, involved in uh, starting up an AFA program, uh, or SASASIT program here. Uh, so let me put it like this. Thank you very much for all the panelists to give us the insights about the different aspects that you are facing and challenges that you are facing. Uh, the beauty of being involved in a, uh, in a regional program like this is that you can actually share experiences and also somehow harmonizing uh, the curriculum so that if one country is, has shortcoming in instrument and other things, you can send students together to each other as well as when it's kind of a harmonized system then uh, you can also create a, a, a position on uh, exchange of students between the countries. So please uh, elaborate on harmonizing curricula of agriculture, which is agriculture education, which is modern and linked with the needs of the society. And this is where the private sector is coming in. Uh, that the private sector should also be involved in uh, developing curricula and asking what type of expertise is that they want you to, to so to say, what type of uh, students they want to have. And I, I'm strongly believing on, so to say, uh, curriculum development linked with research activities. Uh, and then this research activities is a type of uh, research for use, if we put it that, uh, like this. And then, again, private sector must be involved in uh, developing. The student's perspective that Hilda is mentioning is actually very important because we know that the agricultural education in most of the countries that we are talking about is not modern, modernized and they are not responding to the needs of, of the new generation of scholars. Yeah? Uh, another issue that is important and it has to do with the quality of education is actually along the side the, the development of curricula you need also to look at incentives for the uh, lecturers. If the incentives is not there, then the, the, the example of Kenya, that lecturers are looking for more money. They're running from one university to another, another university and only giving some kind of copies to the student. Take this and then I will examine you after that. So please consider, because now we have uh, the names of many of the universities here consider about the incentives for the lecturers because it is at the end the quality uh, of education is very much depending on the lecturers as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the physical the ils ont aussi formé les paysans qui sont dans, dans, dans la vallée aux nouvelles techniques de, de, de agricoles. Donc c'est intéressant. L'autre volet, je pense qu'il est important aussi d'harmoniser, d'harmoniser et de faire des échanges entre nos différents pays, aussi bien des échanges d'étudiants, de, des échanges d'enseignants, mais aussi de se retrouver autour donc, de formations pour avoir à peu près les mêmes formations et d'harmoniser. Je donne un exemple qui, qui, qui peut-être a fait tâche douce. Le Coraf a financé un master qui est en partage entre sept universités africaines. Cette université africaine partage aujourd'hui un master hein, dans, le domaine, dans, le dom, dans le domaine agricole. Il est important aujourd'hui que des structures comme par exemple ANAFE, comme ICRAF, etc., songent à, euh, à, appuyer, à appuyer les universités à aller dans le sens d'une harmonisation et dans le sens de partage de formation dans, dans le domaine agricole. Merci. Thank you very much. I will talk about the issue of second choice students. I think we have a challenge here where we need to attract students to give their first choices. And that may require repackaging our programs so that they attain an appeal, they have an appeal to the students so that we come number one. We might need to reprofile our, our programs and also make sure that there is enough knowledge about 
the professional possibilities and profiles of the people who graduate from our institutions and publish about what we do. Because clearly, unless students get to know what we offer and what that means for them in terms of life and future professional advancement, probably we shall continue having second choices. But also we run a risk of being redundant and finally irrelevant as far as the training is concerned for students. Excuse me, Katolo, what is second choice? Could you explain? Second choice is people telling you, I mean, they could, for example, offer uh, medicine as their first choice, and then forestry as their second choice. So that when you go for selection, you're basically forcing somebody to take a second choice or a third choice. That is what has been happening to us. Maybe the other thing I want to talk about. The other thing I want to talk about is about uh, participation of stakeholders in the, in the curriculum issues. I think we need to kind of like intensify professor study so that we do have the opportunity to interface with the various stakeholders, the industrialists, the users of our practice, so that we get a feedback and that will be very important when we are looking at doing curriculum and developing them. And then also adapting curriculum review and development process that are participatory so that like uh, uh, the lady has said we do not sit somewhere in some nice hotel and come up with a curriculum where stakeholders are not at all participated. I think what that is very important. Finally, Chair, before I pass over the mic, the issue of pedagogy. I think it is very serious that we get to understand that if I'm concerned with a PhD problem, I'm not that good in delivering. And therefore, look at that aspect of empowering, skilling ourselves in terms of delivery of pedagogical issues. And on in this front, I think ANAF is doing a very good job, getting some of us teachers, lecturers, to go and get skilled. And I think this should, have, should continue. Thank you. On the pedagogic training, I think I would agree with what Dr. Casolo is saying. And also say that the reason why Professor Yeroku in the morning was saying that there were half-baked students during his time, we are half-baked now and maybe in five years they'll still be half-baked, is just the aspect of pedagogy because I will teach the best way I know from who, whoever taught me. And so the problem arises that we are using a bad recipe throughout the process. And that's why through and through we are getting poorly uh, prepared students. On the issue of second choice students, I agree because I also am a second choice student. I never chose to be there, but I think what needs to be done by the university, these are programs that the university is offering. The university should own the program and should sensitize and create awareness about the program. Tell the student that you're not in a wrong place. It's just different from what you wanted, but it's not wrong that you're there. And so as, uh, as uh, Alex is speaking about the I work for Nepal and I'm based in Dakar, Senegal. I actually, perhaps it's not a question, but I just want to come back to the debate about pedagogy and the need for university lecturers to get that kind of training. I don't know how many lecturers all over the world actually went through that process. I think what we should be talking about is we have, in those days, we used to go through the ranks from graduate assistants, assistant lecturers, lecturers, senior lecturers. And the process is such that any young person coming into the, uh, to the system is attached to a senior colleague who mentors him. Where is the monitoring today? That is the problem. No lecturer went through that pedagogy that you are referring to. I think it's, let us not pursue that line. We are making a mistake if we go along those lines. What we should be talking about is let us reinforce, let us strengthen our mentoring system, which we have lost. We have lost a lot of that capacity to mentor younger ones, and we have also lost the senior ones. We have lost the capacity to mentor the younger ones. Let us bring back that capacity. Let us try to put up a system where we can begin again to mentor the younger ones and let people actually internalize this. That is the issue. From the old the system, I really appreciate that comment. And I think my, uh, uh, my question is relating to that in a way. Uh, those of us who come from uh, uh, the 1970s, 
uh, we have been teaching in universities from early 1970s to now, will we'll, uh, appreciate the fact that we have changed our curriculum from um, what used to be, uh, we called it a term system, but it was a system where um, it was, they, they used to call it like the British system, to the semesterized system. What it, this has done is to reduce the number of credits that students go through from about 300 plus to 120, which means that content has not been there. Uh, uh, is no longer there. Now, you, 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 by squeezing it that way, when my friend uh, Alex is talking about attachment of three weeks not being, or six weeks not being adequate, there are constraints. These programs are constrained by the fact that the, the credit system is saying you cannot go beyond this. I remember taking programs to the University of Botswana to try and get them approved, and they said to me, cut the credits down to 120. And that is a real problem, because that's a policy of universities. And if we're talking transformation, we must tackle that. But I've not heard anybody talking about looking at the structure of the uh, curricula which we, we deliver. And uh, you see, this is a big limitation to curricula. And we need to address it, especially those of us who are in policy, situation. Um, then there are things in the new curriculum which I think I should highlight. There are things which are called electives where the, the, it's, it's said to broaden the person and the things which are uh, called the GECs, they all eat at the 120 uh, credits and that's a big constraint. And you're asking a lecturer to squeeze what he used to cover into those. These are real issues which need to be addressed. The Pro Vice Chancellor of uh, Swedish University, Agri University for Agricultural Sciences, and uh, we worked with the SLU to offer uh, training on pedagogy to young scientists. We offered, we did it for young lecturers for English-speaking countries, and also we just did it for French-speaking countries in Cote d'Ivoire. And we continue, we'll continue with that. Lena, I just want you to just come in there. Talking about I don't see any opposition between mentoring and uh, training trainers, educational uh, teachers, actually. Uh, actually, it's, uh, mentoring is usually a part of pedagogical courses, but uh, it is followed up by uh, reflections on what has been experienced when you, when you uh, sit in on other uh, lectures uh, and so on. So you, you sort of uh, have an opportunity to get some theory around it and also to discuss and uh, form. And, and I think it's just a good combination. The issue of funding. I think what is happening, especially in my country and probably elsewhere, is there has been suddenly a craze for private students. And in the process, most departments, most faculties are having an over-enrollment in the drive for making money. And therefore, whereas it is a source of funding, it finally stretches the resources that are available. You find students hanging in windows and so on when they are being taught. So I think, whereas they, that drive, I think we need to strike a balance between fairly what is acceptable and what can really mean good. I think what we need to do also is to the teaching aids and equipment that we have. We need, for example, to have funding, for example, in my case, I'm forestry. If I'm given support to establish a teaching forest, a plantation, that can later on generate money by selling the, the trees, by milling, I think that is one aspect that would be very good in terms of capacity building and self sustenance the, the tuition fees, and that is a big issue in Africa. Maybe, Prof, you could raise that in the, 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 the last uh, session. Because uh, our African students are fighting when we increase the tuition fee. But the parents are ready to pay millions to send them abroad. So how do we tackle that? Maybe resource mobilization, as my sister raised, but basically is to encourage that let's go for a joint resource mobilization where universities can engage the private sector and we come up with strategies, with proposals, with projects. A case in point, 
I think Anafe can share the experiences of the current programs that we are running in partnership, building on Unipre, where the private sector is in there, and then we, we kind of build on existing structures and synergies in the place. And that can create sustainability because the government is in there, the private sector is there because, for instance, now under Unibre, the private sector is putting in resources, universities bringing in research and technology, and that's, that's the way to go. The government is coming in for policy. So there is no way, resources will never be enough. Our attitude is the problem. Thank you. I think you have a big job. And the big job has to do with what Professor Montana said, which is an issue. In Nigeria, we have Nigerian Universities Commission. And a couple of years ago, there was a, a, a review on the programs in all the universities. We moved from term system to semester system, and what he said was actually what happened. And so many of the courses were removed, and so many of that ones were merged, and we are ending up with teaching what we think is not enough. And have found out that in most cases in African countries, we try to pattern our curricula to follow the Western curricula. And we are not yet there. Our curricula should be meeting the situation of Africa. And until we learn to do things according to the African situation, I don't know where we are going. Prof has concluded the session. <laughs> and I like, Prof will have a big task in the discussions again. I think there are lots of interesting points that we can rediscuss.